Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to another uh, IFSO webinar. Uh, today we have uh, uh, great uh, panelists, so we're going to be discussing the recent IFSO uh, position statement on Barrett's esophagus and its impact on bariatric surgery. And, um, and um, um, the speaker will be Dr. Oliver Fisher from Australia who is an uh, upper GI and hepatobiliary fellow at the Royal Prince uh, Alfred uh, Hospital. And uh, he's a clinical fellow, upper GI surgery unit at St. George Hospital. And um, you'll enjoy his presentation for sure. Um, we have great panelists. Um, we'll start with Professor Wendy Brown from Australia, who is well known to everyone. She's head of Mon Monash uh, University Department of Surgery in Melbourne and the chair of the IFSO uh, Registry Committee and the clinical lead uh, bariatric surgery uh, registry as well. We have uh, Professor Salman Sabah from uh, Kuwait. He's the associate professor at Kuwait University Department of Surgery, Kuwait City, and the president of the Gulf Obesity Surgical Society and the chair of the IFSO MENA Registry Committee. Um, we have also Professor Luigi Angrisani from Italy, professor and researcher in general surgery, and uh, recently joined the private practice, um, uh, public health department, University of Naples, and the chair of the IFSO Board of Trustees, uh, Professor Jack Hempens from Belgium, Professor of Surgery and Chief Bariatric Metabolic Surgery at Delta uh, Chirik Hospital in Brussels, Belgium, past president of IFSO. Um, welcome, Professor Matt Hutter, a gastrointestinal surgeon at Massachusetts General Hospital, and professor in surgery in Harvard Medical School, and the president of the American uh, Society of Bariatric uh, Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, ASMBS. Um, Professor Caetano Marchesini from Brazil, bariatric surgeon and endoscopist at Hospital Sirio Lebanis, um, and uh, past president of the Brazilian Society of Metabolic uh, and Obesity Surgery, and a member at, at large of IFSO Latin American chapter. Uh, welcome, everyone. And um, a few notes. Uh, to the audience, uh, please type in your questions in the question box. Uh, this uh, webinar will be recorded and uh, will be present in the IFSO Virtual uh, Academy as well as on the IFSO YouTube channel. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's start and um, have the um, most impressive, interesting um, presentation by Oliver. No pressure. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the organizing committee as well as Wendy Brown uh, for allowing me to give this talk on our recent if so 2020 position statement. Um, today, I will be covering a bit more than the position statement. I'll uh, start off with an illustrative case uh, that sort of highlights the um, issues that we face with regards to this disease of bariatric surgery. And then I'll um, go through a few points regarding Barrett's because um, this is a disease where details really matter. And um, I have found that in surgical circles, um, some quite outdated data really gets quoted when discussing this topic. And so um, it was felt that it might be handy to, to go through some of the more up-to-date information regarding this disease. I'll then go over to discussing the position statement, uh, the rationale for the study, um, as well as the key findings, and then go through the key position statements um, and discuss some of the um, points that are being raised there. So this is a patient from clinic, 46-year-old uh, female, BMI 42, who presents uh, inquiring about bariatric surgery. She's got a history of gestational diabetes and had a recent abnormal uh, oral glucose tolerance test with a GP, was told to lose weight and has struggled with that, um, has occasional back pain, will take any sort of painkillers that are available at home, including um, ibuprofen, uh, if that's around. Um, she had really bad reflux during pregnancy. Um, that's gotten a bit better. 
Um, and because of the issues that have now existed with her weight and her feeling a bit unhealthy and the diabetes, um, she finally gave up smoking, although one should say that her overall smoking history isn't too bad with uh, sort of about a 10 pack year history. Because of all of her reflux issues and smoking, her GP sent her for a scope a year ago, um, which diagnosed about a one centimeter um, segment of Barrett's. Um, she had H. pylori, which was eradicated. And uh, sort of her social history indicates that she lives quite a far away from, from any sort of um, healthcare setting, uh, about 250 kilometers because she's a farmer um, and lives and works on her farm. So this is sort of a patient that we might get to see in Australia who comes from the countryside seeking um, to do something. So what are we gonna do? Are we gonna offer this patient a sleeve or should it be a rheumal Y gastric bypass? Should it be a one anastomosis bypass or a SADI? Is this the type of patient where you might consider putting in a band or doing an endoscopic procedure? Or is this a patient where because of these medical issues that exist, we might shy away and say, no, this risk profile is too high and you probably shouldn't have surgery at all. So thank you, Oliver, for this uh, interesting case. Uh, uh, Manuela, if we can launch uh, the poll asking the same question to the audience. And let's have the panelists as well, um, uh, given their opinion on, um, on, uh, on this patient. On this patient. Um, I'll start with, um, I'll start with um, Professor Brown. Professor Brown. What do you oh, think? Great. What would just started with me. Um, look, it's a young woman, youngish woman, younger than me, so therefore young by definition. Um, the BMR 42 that does have comorbidities associated with her obesity, so would definitely benefit from weight loss. Um, she has a short segment of Barrett's, it's only, I think Oliver said, a centimetre. And so the likelihood of over her lifetime of that progressing to cancer, I think, is in the order of about one in a thousand. So I think I would talk to the patient and I would kind of put the risks versus the benefits, so the risks of the surgery versus the potential benefits of weight loss, um, and then also the potential risks of the surgery. So with, you know, sleep gastrectomy, we know there's a risk of reflux, but we also know with the bypass procedures that there is a risk of bile reflux. And that's true more for one anastomosis gastric bypass, but it's still true for Ron Y. We've been doing some HIDA studies recently, and you can see quite profound bile reflux um, in the Ron Y bypass patients. And it's a slightly shorter pouch, so potentially there is still some bile that gets up there. But I think on balance, you'd probably say no AGB potentially is more risky than a rule and why. But then again, so therefore, in you know, if you think that maybe Barrett's can go to cancer, you might want to take an option where you can potentially do an esophagectomy and reconstruct in the future. So that talks about the Barrett's, sorry, about the bypass procedures. But with the evolution of our endoscopic procedures, we have the options of um, surveying closely every two to three years and offering an EMR or other ablative therapy. So I think it's an open question. I think any of these options could work. Um, and if they wanted a sleeve, I'd be comfortable with that, but I'd tell them they have to have very, very close follow-up. Um, but I suppose I would probably push them more towards a laparoscopic rural gastric bypass if I had to really push them. That's a, a diplomatic answer. Uh, uh, Salman, what would you do? A uh, quick comment, and uh, if we can uh, launch the results, Manuela, meanwhile. Yeah, I think this is like a, a, a challenging case, and uh, you know, from, from the Middle East where I come from, you know, the incidence of Barrett's is, uh, according to the current knowledge, is less than the Western countries. And uh, again, in this case, so I will think uh, as Wendy, I mean, in terms of uh, her thought process, I will be more towards doing a gastric bypass. However, uh, you know, we need to know more about Barrett's, especially short uh, segment Barrett's and the risk of converting to adenocarcinoma uh, is probably around one in a thousand or so. Uh, so, and this patient is 46 years old. And so probably I will, if the patient, we are gonna have really a thorough discussion with the patient and all these options are out there, even endoscopic procedures like for example, TIF, and then we can discuss with her uh, uh, the weight loss program. But uh, I think in, for me, the best option for this patient will be Roe and Y gastric bypass. Uh, Professor Hodder?
I think you can uh, see the audience is agreeing with the, the first two panelists. If we can close the poll so we can see the. So Matt Hutter here, um, you know, I think from, from our standpoint, um, this is a great presentation for a case. I look forward to the further discussion, um, but here there's no perfect answer. And in what we in the United States tend to do is share decision-making with the patient talk about the risks, talk about the benefits, give them options and see what they say. Um, so here, for me, um, I would probably lean towards a ruin why gastric bypass, but they have to be willing to give up their non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. I have to be convinced that the recidivism from smoking is low in this individual patient. And so I think those are the things that we would need to discuss. At, at the end of the day, our patients are fairly opinionated. Um, so when we draw diagrams, I said, I don't want my anatomy to be, re, you know, to be done. Or we hear uh, my hairdresser at a bypass and she gained all her weight back. I want the sleeve, the newer one. And these complex decisions are really made in partnership with the patients and we can educate them we can encourage them um, but um, but at the end of the day i think surgery any surgery would be better than no surgery for this patient um great thank you professor hutter and i think for the sake of time we'll leave the rest of the panelists till the end to express their opinion but please do let us know if uh, uh, oliver uh, uh, was successful in changing your mind uh, so let's uh, start the second part of the presentation. So that leads me over to discussing one of the points of concern in this patient, which is that she has so-called Barrett's esophagus. Now, as you all know, Barrett's esophagus is a acquired condition of the distal esophagus where the normal squamous lining is replaced by a specialized intestinal type metaplasia with or without goblet cells. It depends a little bit on where you live in this world um, as a response to sustained gastroesophageal reflux disease. This Barrett's columnar epithelium bears within it the potential to progress through the stages of low-grade dysplasia to high-grade dysplasia to then form invasive cancer. We know that it affects approxim approximately one to two percent of Western populations with the main risk factor being gastroesophageal reflux disease and it is the only known precursor to esophageal adenocarcinoma. Now, the traditional teaching has been this linear pathway to cancer formation, and this was underpinned by studies sort of in the early 2000s, which identified uh, genetic events that took place, and they put them into order, and we had this very neat model of linear progression, very much analog to Fogelstein model of colorectal cancer. But as knowledge has progressed, we now know that this is not at all true and that the real road to cancer looks a lot more like this. Patients will develop early changes in their distal esophagus as a result of gastroesophageal reflux and will progress to develop Barrett's. Now, for a non-significant proportion of patient, the, end, the journey ends here and they get parked on the side. And these are the patients who never change their length of Barrett's, they always have non-dysplastic Barrett's, and it was just an adaptation of the body to the reflux, and actually nothing bad's going to come from it. There are, however, this group of patients who have early genomic changes that take place, including things like p53 mutations, that put them onto this pathway of dysplasia formation, which can go then through low-grade dysplasia to high-grade dysplasia, and then lead them down to the road of, can road of cancer. But we also know that there are more dramatic events, such as chromothripsis or genome doubling events, which can put these patients in the fast lane to cancer. And these are the ones we really, really worry about because they're hard to identify. And they are the ones, these patients are the ones who really deserve intense screening and treatment. But equally, we really want to identify these patients here who have this totally benign Barrett's where not, we could actually spare them the intense screening that they're currently undergoing. So who does it affect? Well, the archetypical patient is the old Caucasian male with a long history of reflux. That is your archetypical patient. It's also associated with the presence of hiatus hernia, as we know, and also with adiposity, particularly central adiposity. So these are sort of the clinical risk factors that we know. In terms of clinical risk factors that determine the risk of progression, and when we're talking about progression, 
all studies or most studies tend to lump together high grade dysplasia and esophageal adenocarcinoma. Why? Well, first of all, the rate of progression is quite low, so you need a compounded endpoint. But secondly, also uh, high grade dysplasia, we treat it almost the same as invasive cancer, or sorry, as, as, as pre invasive cancer. Um, and it also is regarded as a marker of an increased risk of cancer. So if, di if you diagnose high grade dysplasia, you have to go back and go looking uh, for a cancer that might be there. Risk factors for progression, there are disease-specific factors as well as patient factors, and I'm going to pick out a couple of them that are relevant to us as bariatric surgeons to discuss them a bit further so that you know the details surrounding this. And that is the issue of gender, the issue of obesity, um, the presence of dysplasia, as well as the Barrett segment length. So what is the actual risk of progression? of Barrett to malignant cancer. And this is something, that, the, the, this is where all the numbers that get thrown around at meetings and stuff are usually wildly inaccurate. When you go back and look at the studies, what we found is that with every decade of progressing research, the estimates go down and down and down again. And that's because studies have become better. They adjust for baseline confounders. The cohort sizes and duration of follow-up is better. So the estimates get better. And it's now widely accepted that the rate of progression for non-dysplastic Barrett's to invasive cancer is approximately 0.3% per annum. This is a totally different story for dysplastic Barrett's. And for low-grade dysplasia, it's now quite commonly accepted that the risk of um, progression to high-grade or cancer is approximately 1% to 2% per annum. However, I will flag that there is data from the Netherlands, in particularly from the FOA trial that looked at RFA ablation for low grade, but there's data from the Netherlands that suggests that if a diagnosis of low grade dysplasia is confirmed by consensus by two expert GI pathologists, then the risk of progression may actually be as high as 12%. Similarly, for high grade dysplasia, the risk of progression is about six times higher than it is for low grade, um, with other studies also indicating that the risk of annual progression is approximately 12%. So these are the patients that have sort of that syndromic Barrett's, the Barrett, the bad Barrett's, the stuff that actually really can go on and develop cancer. And what about Barrett's length? Well, that is hugely important as well when talking about risk stratification and also the risk of malignancy. And length definitions, they're quite clear. So long segment greater than three centimeters, short segment uh, small, uh, lesser than three centimeters. And then there's also ultra short segment Barrett's that we like to speak about, and that's Barrett's that's le less than one centimeters. And for those interested in the topic, I do strongly advise this paper by Heiko Pohl, which really elegantly looked at this, at this problem using their own German cohort, but also um, two other databases um, from the US, um, I believe and try to estimate what the actual risk of progression was stratified by length. So they found that for long segment Barrett's, the risk of progression was about 0.2% per annum. For short segment Barrett's, however, it dropped dramatically. It was only about 0.03% per annum. And for ultra short segment Barrett's, it was approximately 0.0% per annum. Based on these data and the that data, the other data that they had, they estimated the number of patients needed to scope to identify invasive disease. And this is where the discussion really took off. And they found that for long segment Barrett's, you'd have to scope approximately 450 patients to identify one patient with cancer. For short segment, that was almost three and a half thousand patients. And for ultra short segment Barrett's, you'd probably have to scope over 12,000 patients to identify a single cancer. This issue of length and the importance of length um, has again recently been confirmed in a recent meta-analysis where they show that for long segment Barrett's, the risk of progression is approximately 0.3% per annum, whereas for short segment Barrett's, it's approximately 6% per annum. Gender matters as well. This has been less well studied, but a very elegant paper by Pratik Sharma and his group came out um, last year that showed that for females, the risk of progression to esophageal adenocarcinoma was only about 0.05% when compared to men, where it was also about 0.3%. And when the combined endpoint of high-grade dysplasia and esophageal adenocarcinoma was looked at, women were about 10 times less likely to develop esophageal adenocarcinoma 
And there are a few other studies that confirm this that sort of suggest that probably males are two to four times more likely to progress. And importantly, there seem to be gender specific differences that we don't quite understand yet in that the peak of diagnosis of cancer in men precedes that of women or by approximately 20 years. So there's about a 20 year lag in women in the diagnosis of cancer. And that's relevant for our bariatric surgical population. So I guess when I've now given you data to suggest that the risk of progression of cancer actually isn't that bad, then what do patients with Barrett's actually die from? And this has been looked at. So we have good population-based data, which has looked at this, and they showed that the risk of esophageal cancer, or patients dying from esophageal cancer who had a known diagnosis of intestinal metaplasia was only about 5%. Another study from the UK confirmed this, where they looked at it and they found that only about 2% of patients with Barrett's were going to die of esophageal adenocarcinoma in 10 years. However, patients tended to die from other things such as ischemic heart disease. Equally, another population-based study found a very similar thing. Patients tend to die more frequently from cardiovascular disease and non-esophageal cancers compared to esophageal cancer. And again, Doug Corley and his group showed a similar thing where cause-specific mortality in patients with Barrett's was elevated for things such as ischemic heart disease, respiratory system disease, and other digestive diseases, and not esophageal adenocarcinoma. So why is this all relevant to us? Well, bariatric surgery, I don't have to convince the audience of this. It is here to stay. It is, despite all the great developments of drugs that exist, currently it remains the single best treatment for management of obesity and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Now, as good as that story is, the issue is that obese patients tend to have Barrett's, or it's a risk factor of Barrett's, but we actually don't know how many patients who are presenting for bariatric surgery have Barrett's. We know that bariatric surgery can cause reflux, and there are increasing reports on the incidence of Barrett's after bariatric surgery. What we don't know, however, is what happens to patients who have established Barrett's and undergo bariatric surgery. And then, as mentioned before, up to 80% of our patients are female, and how that influences the whole story is entirely unclear. And this I guess, is what everyone's worried about. You do something with the best of intentions, trying to help patients lose weight and get back on track to have, have a healthier lifestyle. And maybe what we're doing might expose them to an increased risk of a very devastating disease. And these case reports are increasingly frequent um, and I think very well known to the audience. So with all of that in mind, that was sort of the rationale for this study. So we, put together a task force um, to try and summarize the available evidence surrounding this topic, and then to try and devise some key position statements that might try and help guide the community. So the aims of the study were to sort of quantify and get data, actually proper data to try and inform this discussion. So what is the incidence, the pre-operative incidence of Barrett's? What is the post-operative incidence of Barrett's? particularly in the context of laparoscopic sleep gastrectomy, is there any data to suggest that Barrett's might regress after bariatric surgery because we know that bypassing procedures have been used to treat recalcitrant reflux? And for this, we performed a systematic review and meta-analysis. We included not just published papers, but also conference abstracts um, based on recommendations from the Cochrane group. We did that, but also to try and identify all available information to try and achieve a accurate estimate of what these incidence rates are. Duplicate cohorts were removed. So if there were groups reporting on sort of five and 10 year outcomes, then we took those with the most recent data. And after applying filtering criteria and exclusion criteria, we ended up with 56 studies that we could use for our quantitative uh, meta-analysis. So what is the preoperative incidence of Barrett's? When all studies were taken together that had information of this, we found that the preoperative incidence was estimated to be about 2%. However, as with all of these studies, they are at risk of bias. And so we assess the risk of bias and we assess the quality of the studies, the methodologies by which they try to um, diagnose Barrett's. Was it just endoscopic or was it by histology? Where were the biopsies taken from, et cetera? Um, and when we included only those studies deemed as being at low risk of bias, we estimated that about 6% of patients 
presenting for bariatric surgery have Barrett's esophagus, and that's about six times higher than the general population. What's the post-operative incidence of this disease? Well, when all studies are taken together, then it's about 2%. And we stratify that, of course, according to the procedures, because we know that those uh, procedures matter. And when we then looked at the sleeve gastrectomy, which is obviously the most popular procedure being performed and the one with the highest concern regarding reflux and reflux-associated complications, this is what we found. All studies that were published, which included about 14,000 patients, estimated that about 2% of patients develop Barrett's postoperatively. However, again, sensitivity analysis had to be performed because there were studies in there that were at risk of bias. So when studies that were excluded and only those were looked at in whom patients had been screened preoperatively with an endoscopy where the Barrett's was diagnosed by histology, uh, sorry, where, where their esophagus had been sampled um, preoperatively and the postoperatively the Barrett's was diagnosed with histology. When we took those studies and looked at them, then the postoperative incidence rate was approximately 6% as well. So these are patients with true de novo development of Barrett's and that's data derived from about 760 patients. When we then adjust for length of follow-up, so those studies that had long follow-up, because obviously the longer you have reflux, the higher the risk is that you develop Barrett's. Then we found that the risk of Barrett's after a sleeve was approximately four and a half percent. So what about regression? Well, when we looked at studies in whom patients had been preoperatively diagnosed with Barrett's, who then underwent a gastric bypass, sorry, a Rouen Y gastric bypass, there are a lot of studies but actually not that many patients. So data on this, whilst extremely encouraging because it indicates that about 60% of patients may regress um, if they have a Rouen Y, um, the data is only derived from about 118 patients, but still some very encouraging findings. I will flag, however, that regression definitions were not uniform across the different studies and regression meant either a reduction in length or a regression in dysplasia. So let's say something going from low grade dysplasia down to um, non-dysplastic Barrett's. So what about patients with Barrett's who undergo a sleeve gastrectomy? I mean, we know that these patients exist because 6% of obese patients presenting for bariatric surgery will have Barrett's and not everyone is, is scoping their patients preoperatively. So there is definitely in the community a large amount of patients who've had Barrett's and then had a sleeve but there is no published data on this. And this is hugely relevant because if you're a data purist, then you have to admit to the fact that, well, then we don't know. We, we, don't, we assume it's not good to do this, but we actually have no data to support that. And the reason for that must be that most bariatric surgeons seem to feel that Barrett is a contraindication to a sleeve. And therefore one would be led to believe that in those patients who are being screened, that if they have Barrett's, they get a bypass instead. So what are the key points of the uh, position statement? I'll quickly run through the first three points because they're not that controversial and I think pretty straightforward. Um, all of us do this anyway. Patients need to be assessed for complications of reflux or the presence of reflux. And I think, you know, all people, people, all people who offer sleeves and, and uh, bypasses, et cetera, do this regularly anyway. Uh, but I guess what's important to remind oneself of is that Barrett's is, a, is an adaptation. And typically, actually, what happens is the patients go from being symptomatic to now non-symptomatic. And there are no real symptoms associated with Barrett's. And then I guess this is a bit of a redundancy. But the reality is that, and, and this is sort of stemmed from the studies that didn't report on this that we included. Um, you know, if you do diagnose salmon colored mucosa on your endoscopy, then the length of Barrett's needs to be documented appropriately and all the esophagus, the effect of the esophagus needs to be sampled appropriately according to the Seattle protocol to identify any dysplasia. And why? Because it was felt that if the patients do have any form of dysplastic Barrett's or even low-grade dysplasia, then probably these patients should be considered for preoperative therapy before they undergo any bariatric procedure. And that doesn't matter if it, whatever procedure it is. It was felt that, that this is probably a relevant thing to identify and treat prior to any weight loss surgery. Now, in the presence of long segment Barrett's or dysplastic Barrett's, it was felt that procedures where the distal esophagus might subsequently be exposed to higher concentrations of acid or bile 
that this is not a smart thing to do. And that's based on the available evidence to suggest that risk of progression goes up with the segment length and of course with dysplasia. And that probably creating an environment where there is an increased risk of acid or bile reflux, that that is probably not a sensible thing to do. However, when the discussion came to short segment Barrett's, then things became somewhat more complicated. And I guess that's with the data in mind that I would present it to you before. The risk of progression with short segment Barrett's is actually fairly low. And we know that patients with Barrett's esophagus tend to die of other conditions, particularly things like ischemic heart disease. So if you have an obese patient with short segment Barrett's, you probably have competing risks for mortality in this patient, some of which can be very well addressed with a bariatric procedure. And therefore, it was felt that a sleeve, for example, cannot be categorically discouraged in view of the long-term health benefits that a patient might derive from bariatric metabolic surgery. But this is an evidence-free zone, one has to say. There is no data to let us know what actually happens with these patients. And therefore, it was felt that one has to consider this extremely carefully. And most importantly, I think that if people are going to think about doing this, that these patients have to be captured in prospective um, registries so that we can audit and see what actually happens with them. And I guess importantly, that whilst this is a bit of a softening of previous statements that might exist on the topic, it can't be viewed as a blanket approval to perform a sleeve in a patient with Barrett's, but that there is a paucity of data. And what I've hopefully shown you today is that it's a complicated topic with a lot of ifs, whens, and buts that need to be considered prior to making a definitive decision. This is in line with the endoscopy statement from the IFSO committee and that screening of a patient who has undergone a sleeve is recommended. Um, I guess this is a controversial area and I'll show you some data as to why it's so controversial. And, you know, I guess the reality is that this is an area of evolving knowledge and therefore it's our responsibility as a community to try and help contribute to the evolution of this knowledge. And the screening intervals that are being recommended are those that we would probably recommend in the context of, um, of uh, you know, long segment Barrett's. And this position might change over time because the efforts that are associated with screening and the yields are still a bit unclear. And I'll give you a quick back of the envelope calculation that some of the critics of this actually like to use. So say your institution performing about 100 sleeves a year, and this is what happens over five years, you perform about 500 sleeves now, assuming a 6% incidence rate of five years, this is the group of patients you're left with that now have Barrett's. If you now assume that 0.3% per annum of these will progress to cancer, if you look at 10 years time, this is your reality. You've got now 1,000 patients who have had a sleeve and you have to screen 1,000 patients to identify two of them who might have developed esophageal adenocarcinoma. And to scale that to sort of our country in Australia where we performed approximately 45,000 sleeves in the last bariatric surgery registry, you're looking at screening 45,000 patients to identify approximately 90 patients with high-grade dysplasia or cancer. And that's 45 endoscopies every two to three years. So that is a very difficult conversation, and I don't have any good answers to that, but I think that sort of brings us full circle back to the study by Heiko Pohl and colleagues that showed that for ultra-short segment Barrett's to identify one cancer, you probably had to screen over 12,000 patients. So resource utilization, et cetera, is a very valid debate. I guess uh, this is also just important to consider that uh, we don't know if any of this applies to people of Asian heritage because uh, none of the studies were from, from Asian countries. And something which is very dear to my heart, and I know that, that many of the, the scientific and executive board felt the same, um, we strongly encourage prospective and particularly population-based studies on this topic. And there's recently been one published by um, our colleagues in Canada. This type of stuff is really, really helpful. But also when these studies, when, when you're studying the incidence of Barrett's in particularly sleeve patients, identifying potentially confounding factors such as anatomical abnormalities, the presence of hiatus hernia, pouch sizes and pouch 
uh, and, and sort of sleeve pathology, strictures, distal obstruction, et cetera, that's highly relevant because what we don't know is all of these patients who go on to develop Barrett's or de novo Barrett's after sleeve, maybe they've actually got underlying sleeve pathologies, pathologies that are actually triggering the development of their reflux and Barrett's. And so that is something which was really not at all well documented in any of the published series until now, and therefore warrants a lot of attention. Unresolved questions? Well, I guess the reality is this is Barrett's, and so on Barrett's, there are always a million unresolved questions. But one of the key things, and I think one of the most important things, is one thing we really don't know is if the Barrett's that these patients um, develop is actually the same as the Barrett's that we see in the population. And we also have no idea how female gender impact, impacts the risk of cancer formation in these patients. And we also have no idea about the mitigating effects of weight loss on the risk of malignancy. It's entirely possible that through the patients losing weight, their risk of malign malignancy actually goes down. And there are a bunch of more questions that, that exist. So coming full circle back to the patient I presented at the beginning of the talk, what is it that she should have? A sleeve, a bypass or something else? Well, if I haven't been able to provide any data today to convince you of doing the one thing, then hopefully I've provided enough to confuse you. And with that, I'd like to hand over to the panel for discussion. Thank you for your attention. I'd also like to thank Professor Wendy Brown for seeing the study through with me and the IFSA Scientific Committee and Executive Board for their valuable contributions. I'd also like to thank my mentors who have uh, hugely impacted my um, understanding of this disease, as well as um, in the context of bariatric surgery to ask critical questions. And most importantly, I'd like to thank my wife and my kids for uh, remaining my motivation to do this every day. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Oliver, for this uh, excellent presentation. Um, if we can stand it, uh, standing ovation. Um, but uh, definitely clear, and you raised uh, the uh, entire um, lack of data points that we face as surgeons. If we can launch the poll again and see the effect of your presentation on the audience and see if they um, anything changed their minds, would you do uh, the same or did uh, any of the points that uh, Oliver um, raised uh, change your point of view? And I'll continue with the panel, um, Professor, um, Luigi Angrisani, what would you offer this patient? Um, um, I think, thank you, thank you for asking my opinion. Uh, I think in, in, uh, in principle, I, I fully agree that uh, the best operation in this situation is the ruan wagasic bypass. But uh, I clarify that uh, during this uh, presentation, the, I was more convinced uh, of my thesis that uh, you you need to be very careful to the presence of hiatal hernia because uh, this is one of the problem when you do ruan Y in a patient with reflux or Barrett. You need absolutely to reduce the hernia in the abdomen if he is if it is and i think that the percentage of obese people with reflux and a hiatal hernia is very very high in my own practice i do more than 50 percent of my obesity operation room y and sleeve and banding occasionally have hiatal hernia repair so I think this is to make a good room Y that I would prefer, you need to do a hiatal hernia repair. But this is similar if you want to offer a sleeve gastrectomy or if you want to offer what is uh, a new uh, area of investigation I am working on that is the Nissan sleeve. That is another current option, not widely available but should be considered thank you and i think you managed to uh, change one percent of the audience uh, it was 77 percent now it's down to 76 percent uh, uh, let's hear from uh, professor hintons what would you do in this patient Uh, we can't hear you. 
Now we can. Sorry. Now we can. Okay. All right. So I said I don't know. Um, and there are a few very significant points in this uh, presentation. This excellent presentation, by the way. I think it's 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 one of Oliver. Congratulations, and you too, Wendy. You were beautiful. Anyway, um, so what we have to uh, take into account is first, uh, this patient's Barrett is a short Barrett, and so I think there is a growing consensus as to that short Barrett is actually no Barretts, and so there's high likelihood that uh, the natural history as explained of short Barretts is probably pretty much benign. And another important uh, point is that that lady had uh, helicobacter at one point, and that was uh, eradicated, if I'm not mistaken. And so that's, uh, I would say almost, if you want to do a sleeve, that's unfortunate because we know that Helicobacter has a protective effect on the esophagus in terms of uh, evolution towards uh, adenocarcinoma. But I think the most important factor is that this lady lives 250 kilometers away from the nearest hospital. And I don't know about Australia, but in Belgium, I can tell you if somebody lives 250 kilometers away from the nearest hospital, which is impossible but still, uh, we, we will never see this patient again. And that patient will not undergo endoscopy, will not take vitamins, will not do anything. So I think we have to take all those factors into account. Uh, and so actually, I think that the only solution in this case for this particular patient would be a, uh, a sleep. And perhaps like Luigi mentioned, maybe you can do a nissen sleep. But we all know that with a nissen sleep, weight loss is significantly lower than with the normal sleeve gastrectomy. So it's an open question, but I think there are arguments in favor of performing a distance sleeve. Caetano? Um, uh, well, there's not well, after all the guys said before me, but I agree a lot with Dr. Hinkins about the distance. About the distance. We know this can bring a lot of problems. These patients do not come back. Not come back. Uh, I know this patient has diabetes, so weight loss is important. Lou and I guess very nice for this patient if she had access or had to be more near to the hospital. Still, I would talk to the patient and talk about the options, talk about the risks. Uh, my first option would be a ruinite gastric bypass, not a sleeve. I, I really have a lot of uh, concerns about sleeve gastrectomies. We're seeing more and more weight regain. We're seeing more and more problems in doing the surgery. There's, you know, surgeons doing it thinner and thinner to try to, to put a, a, a final outcome on losing weight. Uh, and we know this can bring other problems to the esophagus. Uh, and so I still would talk about, but my first option would talk about ruinite gastric bypass, second option, a sleeve gastrectomy, but always with the patient uh, understanding what's going on and knowing that she will have to return or to keep up the vitamins and exams or to do endoscopies uh, routinely. So we come full circle, uh, Oliver. and. Uh... Now it's your patient, it's presenting to you. And um, just a correction uh, on my presentation, Oliver is a upper GI surgeon working in Sydney, Australia, actually. And he did uh, his uh, PhD in prognostic biomarkers in Barrett's esophagus and esophageal adenocarcinoma, and subsequently four and a half years in clinical fellowship in surgical oncology and upper GI and hepatobiliary surgery. So. That's the gist of the presentation. And now you're gonna give us the answer. Uh, I, I don't think I can I can give you a straight answer. Um, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I personally think that um, the the risk, as, as, as Wendy pointed out at the beginning of the presentation, the risk for this patient to actually develop a significant problem in her distal esophagus is probably lower than her risk of uh, dying of complications of metabolic diseases or, or cardiovascular diseases. And um, I 
also think what we what I didn't have time to address or what I haven't mentioned at all is the protective effects of using PPI and potentially even aspirin. Uh, we do have now a great randomized controlled trial, the ASPECT trial that was published about 18 months ago that shows that PPI high dose plus 370, 375 milligrams of aspirin daily reduces your risk of progression of Barrett. So, you know, we've got these options. And I, I my biggest concern for this patient is performing a bypass um, where, you know, she, she lives far away from from anywhere. So any pain medication she has at home, she'll take. So she might take NSAIDs. She's only stopped smoking a year ago, and we know that that has tremendously high recidivism. And if this patient either has a perforated stomal ulcer or an internal hernia, and is that far away from, from any sort of healthcare setting, then I'm worried that that's more relevant for her than actually having a sleeve that might end up being beneficial for her in the long term. So, I mean, I, I think the biggest problem that I'm faced with after having done all of this is that the overall quality of the studies that we have to inform us are still quite poor. Um, and th there's a lot of heterogeneity throughout the studies. And at some times we had to go a bit on good faith um, that, the, that the practitioners were reporting correctly um, in terms of how they were doing things. And so uh, I think that there is still a lot of more information to come. Um, and therefore, uh, I, I don't think that in 2021 we have a perfect answer for this problem. Um, but I would probably to just not not you know if you want you want a concrete answer I'd say I'd probably lean more towards doing a sleeve in this patient and surveying them postoperatively than actually doing a bypass. Okay, so um, we've concentrated on this patient, but let's look at the bigger perspective. Uh, I think you raised many uh, dilemmas, and we still have more to come, Dr. Brown. Um, how should surgeons interpret this position statement? You know, we have a vast variety of surgeons, private surgeons, academic, public. Uh, how, how would you interpret it from their standpoint? I think this position statement, position statements by their very nature are there to provide guidance in areas of controversy. If we knew the answer, we wouldn't need position statements. So I think what we've tried to provide in a position statement is the current evidence as of um, 2020, um, being published in 2021, and to give people an overview of what the potential is for Barrett's esophagus, which is obviously an area of concern in bariatric surgery. I mean, when we look at all cause mortality from cancer after bariatric surgery, it does drop. The only exception is esophageal cancer. Esophageal cancer doesn't change. The the, the chance of dying from an esophageal cancer doesn't change when people lose weight following a bariatric procedure. So there, there is a risk there with, um, with cancer. And so I think as an international organisation, we have a responsibility to our patients to look at the literature carefully. But if we knew the answer, we'd be putting out didactic guidelines. And we, so we don't know the answers. So we've put out what we think are reasonable and very safe suggestions. But we recognise that being able to um, take take on those suggestions in the real world may not be possible for some people. So um, wherever you practice, things may be different. So I think people should look at these as guidance. They should see them as our best interpretation of the literature at the time that we've done the study. And they should also expect that we'll be re-looking at the literature in two years' time. And maybe what we'll be advising them may be slightly different. Great points. So, uh, Dr. Hodder, uh, from the ASMBS eyes, uh, I know ASMBS is working on its own position statement and uh, the draft was circulating uh, late last year. Maybe you can give us an insight on it. Um, the, you have a spectrum. It's an exhaustion of resources versus protecting all patients. And um, how there was a recent study uh, uh, in New York statewide that looked at more than 48,000 patients and downplayed the uh, role of Barrett's um, after bariatric surgery and with 10-year fall. So how would you interpret it from an ASMBS and a president standpoint? 
Sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this panel. I think it's been a great discussion. Oliver, you knocked it out of the park. Uh, congratulations. Um, and, and and Wendy, Oliver, uh, Ahmed, every, the whole team, congratulations on this, 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 this uh, manuscript that you wrote. I think it's very powerful. We get caught up a lot in what is a review, what is a position statement, what is a guideline, and how they're supposed to be used. And um, in, in, unfortunately, in the United States, the medical legal aspect is, is pretty robust. And so when we say things like should or this has to be done, it becomes quite, it puts people in a, in a rock and a hard place. And so I think choosing our words carefully um, is very important for these when, when we're speaking on behalf of the society. Um, I really, I really, in, this work I think is excellent. I think pointing out the controversy, providing some guidance, and, and the only difference really from the ASMBS side is we have to just be a lot more careful with our medical legal climate and, uh, and what is actually, you know, a word like should we change to is justifiable. So we want to make sure that the insurance companies will still pay for the endoscopy, but not make it that if they it's not done that um, and the patient ends up unfortunately getting cancer, that it will be problem um, from uh, a medical legal standpoint. So walking that line, ours was likely to, uh, without giving out the punchline because it's going to be out shortly, we'll say things like is justifiable to do preemptive endoscopy. Not that it's required and not that you shouldn't do it, but it's justifiable and similar with, with the, the follow-up later on. So a great discussion, great work, and, um, and we we'll look forward to getting ours, which will echo many of this, softening a little bit of that language for those reasons. Uh, uh, great, and we know, um, that Dr. Jenko, it all started with the, uh, Professor Jenko from Italy. He raised the alarm on Barrett's after sleeve gastrectomy, and later on, right after our position statement was accepted, uh, came out with a sequel paper, which a follow-up of three patients who developed esophageal adenocarcinoma in three sleeve patients who had preoperative endoscopy prior. And so, uh, Professor Luigi, uh, how, how would you deal with that from a surgeon's standpoint? Um, uh, and uh, being in the private sector now, would you treat patients the same way, preoperative endoscopy, thorough surveillance, uh, if you had a patient with Barrett's? Absolutely, preoperative endoscopy, it, 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 is, uh, it has been in my protocol uh, since uh, 1995 since uh, 26 years ago. I operated uh, roughly 4,000 people in bariatric and metabolic surgery, and uh, almost all of them, except about a few during the COVID, uh, the intense COVID lockdown, where we were not fluent with the endoscopy uh, service, uh, I have always uh, preoperative endoscopy, absolutely. The other point uh, that uh, was uh, was not, I mean, was addressed, but uh, perhaps needs to be emphasized that uh, there is definitely not only a gender uh, epidemic uh, uh, influence, but also a um, area, a regional a epidemiological incidence that is important. And uh, for, I worked for a few years in England. In, in the 80s, I wo was working in West Midland. And the number of uh, in, uh, severe esophageal reflux and Barrett uh, in that area was largely more uh, frequent than in Southern Italy, where I live. Uh, substantially, over the last 25 years, I Re, um, can record uh, not more than three or four patients with uh, a clear diagnosis of Barrett. In, in other words, it, it is not uh, a, 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 a frequent uh, situation in my uh, clinical experience and uh, in the area where I live. So therefore, um, I think the point uh, that was addressed regarding the, the 
primary Barrett diagnosis uh, that, as Jacques has said, is a, it can be considered definitely a benign disease. Uh, it also has, is very rare from my part of the world. What I am more concerned is the uh, and the other things uh, regarding the follow-up is that, uh, as I was mentioned before this seminar, I think that the only way to to try to intensify and to improve the rate of follow-up at endoscopy is to do research. Because if you convince patients that you are doing a research and they are on a research protocol and try to educate them that there is a risk and there is a need, perhaps this is the only way you might increase the rate of the postoperative endoscopy after bariatric surgery. The, the, the other point that, uh, uh, that was raised by, by Oliver was also the point of de novo uh, Gerd and de novo Barrett. Uh, uh, I am mostly interested in, in this area because I'm traditionally convinced that being a digestive uh, uh, open surgery before the laparoscopic era and being a digestive uh, surgeon after the laparoscopic era, that when we treat obese people, we need to address both the disease, obesity and GERD. So I, I do not understand the opinion of uh, some authority who says that we are treating uh, obesity and for GERD you can give uh, Nexium or uh, pump inhibitor. I think we, we need to aim at the solution of uh, both the problem. And this is not only for the benefit of the quality of life, but I guess also for the in weight loss result in the long term. And uh, in conclusion, I think that uh, definitely uh, Ruan Y for me remain the gold standard but uh, I think that uh, I'm very, very uh, interested in the data coming from the Nissan sleeve because Nissan sleeve has had the merit of uh, focus, the attention of people on the Krura. That is for me uh, the area, the, 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 the target area for bariatric and metabolic surgery. I mean, you need to recognize, to be able to recognize uh, hiatal hernia. And secondly, you have to be, a, be able to repair that area. And after that, I think you may do other, whatever bariatric operation is more suitable for that given patient. Thank you, Ahmad. Oh, thank you, Professor Luigi. Um, now, um, Salman, um, you recently, published uh, the sleeve gastrectomy book with everything that we need to know on, on sleeve gastrectomy. And you lead the registry um, um, committee uh, in Ifsominak. And we know we face a major hurdle of long-term outcomes, which is the Achilles heel of bariatric surgery and any data regarding Barrett's GERD post sleeve and the amount of procedures that we do in MENA. How do you th think we should um, um, address those deficiencies within our chapter? Uh, thank you, Ahmed, for uh, inviting me. And also, I would like to echo all the panelists. Uh, Oliver, this was an excellent presentation. Thanks. Regarding the, the MENA and, and if so, I think we need to focus more on research, as Professor Luigi mentioned. I think we need to do more research on uh, Barrett's and GERD in, in our region, uh, we need to utilize the registry and have, you know, uh, and work on it. The reason behind that, as you know, that, you know, the Western country have higher rate of uh, Barrett's compared to uh, our region, but still we need to have solid data on that. And then we have to think that we operate on young people here. If we look at the registry, uh, the EFSA registry, if you look at the, our region, uh, we operate on younger patients. Uh, majority are females, uh, which is, you know, maybe could be a kind of uh, protected from Barrett's, but again, we have to follow those patients because we, they were going to live for a longer period, and then we know that cancer 
or like a dino carcinoma could happen 20, 30 years after. So we have to make sure that we keep this in, in mind and we have to think about the next surgeon. So yes, a sleep gastrectomy is an option, but uh, also to think about what will happen in the future if this patient developed a dino carcinoma, what, what we're gonna do. So uh, I, I think it's important for this part of the world that we uh, uh, do more research and also get more people involved in our registries. Great points, thank you, Salman. And uh, Professor Hempens, so, um, you know, this uh, position statement raised all the uh, most important points, but what we still lack a lot. Now, um, you raised the issue raised with the Professor uh, Angersani, the missing sleeve, and we lack any long-term evidence for sleeve gastrectomy, let alone missing sleeve still being considered by many experimental procedure. Uh, would you touch on this topic and when would you when? offer this as a, um, a procedure to patients within the context of this position statement? Well, I think uh, those uh, new experimental procedures, you can only do them uh, as part of a study, of a prospect uh, prospective study. Uh, so therefore, in my practice, uh, I, I don't offer that to patients yet. But uh, I must say that uh, David Noka came to operate in my in my hospital. And he's the expert of end sleeves, and uh, I was I must say pretty much uh, I wouldn't say convinced, but I was impressed with the technique, and uh, it it, uh, it looks like it it makes sense. I think it's worth investigating. But uh, as I said, at this point, uh, it's not being uh, in, in, in my practice. Now, um, to touch on uh, Luigi's uh, <laughs> subject, um, he's right. Uh, the hiatus is extremely important. But the problem is that recurrence rate, Luigi, when you treat hiatal, hiatal hernia, that the recurrence rate varies, according to the literature, between 20 and 80 percent. So it's true that theoretically it's very important, but in practice, I'm not sure it's a wise decision to go and over dissect the hiatus when you perform any type of bariatric surgery. Would agree. Um, Caetano, Latin America has uniquely been. Um, uh, a leader in Rouen Y gastric bypass, despite the uh, pattern of more sleeves uh, throughout the world. Um, do you think it's the answer? And uh, how would you fall, um, uh, since you're an endoscopist, uh, Barrett's after Rouen Y as opposed to other procedures? Uh, we can't hear you yet. Now it's it. It was the sound. The sound was controlled by our our administrator here, and it was difficult to put it on. So you know, there are some things interesting about South America and especially Brazil. We do hear endoscopies routinely preoperatively. Uh, on the uh, contrary, for a lot of other countries, and we do have control, and we do talk to patients that have Barrett's and probably we have just just a lower number of, of publications that we should do showing our experience. And I was thinking just about that and, talk, and listening to Dr. Angrizani talking about what we should put our numbers out and show what we are doing. But we, what we see in Brazil here is different. The, the vision still from the surgeons here we do uh, renal gastric bypasses, and we do have uh, control in the postoperative period too. So the incidence of uh, cancer and after these procedures and, and, and sleeve gastrectomies are not yet out to the literature. We don't have any cases in, from Brazil published, as I know. And uh, we do talk to patients about this and make the, all the control around it. So. Uh, at, at the end of the line, we still are uh, very meticulous about it. 
And, but we, the, we know that the number of sleep gastrectomies are growing in Brazil a lot. Probably in the next years, it will be the, the most done surgery in Brazil. And we still have a lot of questions about that too, Ahmed. Great points. Thank you, uh, Caetano. Uh, uh, Professor Luigi, you wanted to say something. Yes, no, I, it's, uh, it's just a querel between me and uh, Jacques Impens that is my brother friend. But uh, I, I, I was thinking that uh, he's right uh, that there is a high incidence of recurrence of so can you repair the Kura. But I am convinced that uh, it is in my, my own experience I have improved over the years to recognize the anatomical defect and also to repair the anatomical defects. And uh, I agree with Jacques that uh, uh, there is uh, uh, a percentage of uh, recurrence, but uh, I was, I will remind Jacques that in the area of uh, inguinal hernia, for uh, uh, recent, the, 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 the result of uh, 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 prosthetic use in inguinal hernia has reduced the, the incidence rate to one or two percent. But for us uh, who started repairing with the, with the, with the normal non-absorbable stitch, the area was, the, the recurrence area was uh, 20 to 30 percent, but we 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 will uh, we will uh, we we were still repairing the hernia with stitch without having a, a, an excellent result, but we had some results. In other words, I think that uh, the area need to be first of all learn to recognize the anatomical region. I'm recently picturing and video recording all the hiatus I am doing and all my intraoperative diagnosis and repair and I've done this for over 250 cases because I think this is very important. So I think the, the, what, what Jacques is saying, I partially disagree in the idea that uh, evolution of surgery and knowledge of technique uh, is is a great stimulus for us to improve our recurrence rate on the hiatus, maybe using biological prosthesis or or other thing. Although I still think that uh, if you do an anatomical dissection into the mediastinal he uh, area. I have been for ages in uh, for many years in Middle East, uh, or in Saudi Arabia, in uh, Qatar, and there are series of uh, thousands and thousands of sligastrectomy without one hiatoplasty. And when you ask to those people who do sleeve as machine, they say, no, we do not recognize first. This is very important to recognize that there is a disease on the hiatus. And second, there is a great fear of the majority of surgeons who are not coming from standard or classical digestive surgery to operate into the mediastine. You need to dissect the esophagus, to abdominalize the esophagus to do this. And it, this is not easy, but it's not so difficult. Sorry for my prolonged comment. No worries. Uh, we can feel the passion, definitely. Um, uh, the issue of, uh, and one of the attendees raised this question, uh, and maybe you can address it, uh, Professor uh, Brown, sleeve and reflux. And I wanted, uh, I know he wanted to touch on reflux. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ahmed. I, look, I think hiatus hernia is an important topic, but there's a lot more to reflux in sleeves than hiatal hernia repair. And um, I we've done a lot of studies, so led by my colleague Paul Burton and our PhD student Yasmin Yahori, we've just had a paper published in the Annals 
of surgery defining the mechanisms of reflux following sleep gastrectomy. And there's really sort of three different mechanisms, but in essence, the top part of the stomach becomes relatively non-compliant. So in that sleep stomach, so it changes the pressure gradient across the esophagogastric junction. And it means that reflux is far more likely. Plus you have some changes in your degelatory deglutarial, I always say it wrong, your swallowing function and what happens to sleeve and also in your resting function. And they've also had another nice paper that's just been accepted into obesity surgery. So I think just the mechanism of what a sleeve does, how it changes the anatomy, how the bolus of food transits through, because in the, in the um, nuclear med studies we did, the food really whizzes through the sleeve pretty quick, but there's kind of four different areas that get pressurized differently. And so, I think it's pretty clear that that shape does lead to reflux, whether or not you've done a really great hiatal hernia repair. And obviously you should repair a hiatus hernia if you see it, but just like in real life, like in, I'm a, I do a lot of hiatal hernia repairs just for reflux and the correlation between hiatus hernia and reflux is an absolute. So not everyone with a hiatus hernia has reflux and not everyone with reflux has a hiatus hernia as we all know. And I think it's a bit similar with the sleeve, but it's more to do with the function of the sleeve and how sleeves work um, that causes that reflux. So I think it really is a refluxogenic procedure, but whether or not that leads to an increased risk of Barrett's into the longer term, I think we still need those really good prospective studies, as everyone's saying at a community level, um, to really ascertain that. And I think that means also having standard definitions. So just like the global registry, we struggle with how people define things. So when we get the data together, everyone defines things differently. I think things become about 10,000 times worse with Barrett's because everyone defines the endoscopic appearance of Barrett's differently. So I think if we're gonna do these studies, we have to come up with a consensus of how we diagnose Barrett's. Um, and we need to agree to follow something like the Seattle protocol so that we're making sure we get the appropriate sort of biopsies and that we measure that internationally the same way. So uh, Oliver, um, now um, that you are the face of uh, this position statement and uh, um, you're an expert on uh, Barrett's, what are the non-standard therapies that we should know uh, for Barrett's, that's one. And how uh, can we, are there any other um, risks that we can predict um, other than the ones you mentioned. I know Dr. Hempens raised uh, the issue of uh, H. pylori eradication and a uh, CAG-A strain was associated with protection against Barrett's esophagus and esophageal adenocarcinoma. Can you address those? Sure, um, so, I'll, so first of all, thanks for becoming the face of this topic. I Thanks, Wendy, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'll start with uh, uh, addressing the question. So non-standard treatments. I mean, I guess if you if you speak to the true experts, I, I will flag. I don't feel that I'm an expert. There are other people in the world that know much much more about this disease than me. But if you speak to them, I mean, so non-dysplastic Barrett's. I think most of us would just tend to survey. And even when it gets into low-grade dysplasia, there's a bit of a difference of opinion. We've got one good randomized controlled trial that suggests that um, if you use their definitions of dysplasia, that ablation is indeed very protective. And I think that has led to, to many people adopting a strategy of treating low-grade dysplasia, although I would flag that there's just, I think last week, been a five-year follow-up from another group of a prospective trial, albeit much smaller, that showed that there was actually no difference. But um, most people accept that for low-grade and high-grade dysplasia treatment is warranted. And, and that's standard. Everything I think that you learned through training or, or anything, that's remained much the same. I think the area that I mentioned before that really has changed because that study ran over a 10-year period was the ASPECT trial uh, from Jankowski et al. And, and that did suggest that chemo prevention is possible. We long knew that NSAIDs had a probable protective effect on, on uh, Barrett's uh, formation as well as progression. Um, and uh, with PPIs, it wasn't that clear, but now there is uh, data to sort of suggest that there's a synergistic effect of using those both. So that might be an option um, for patients who develop Barrett's. Um, I guess another non-standard treatment for Barrett's, if you want to put it that way, would actually be a Rouen Y. 
Um, so we have data from, albeit only 120 odd patients that I showed before, that if they had Barrett's that developed um, and were treated with a rumen wide gastric bypass, they could that that would regress. And I and I believe that um, our colleagues in Austria have shown the same thing. The patients who have a sleeve who develop Barrett's, if you then do a rumen wide in them, that about 60% will regress. So, I mean, that's a trick to keep up your sleeve, but obviously that's more and more foregut manipulation and more and more, more surgery, so that comes with its own risks. Um, in terms, and I think there was a question also from one of the audience, in terms of recognizing the patients with Barrett's or at risk of Barrett's, I mean, this that that's the holy grail, right? I mean, uh, I think um, clinically it's virtually uh, impossible and the greatest sort of advances in screening and detection probably come from Rebecca Fitzgerald's group out of uh, out of the UK where they've been working on improving ways of screening for people that is with either doing um, cytosponge testing so people swallow a capsule and then pull it out and send that off uh, there's, you know, uh, nasal endoscopy techniques that have been developed. There's uh, breath tests that are coming out, you know, which is which is a highly exciting area. And all of this may well sort of feed into what we end up doing for our patients preoperatively to screen, you know, for this. Um, so yeah, a bit of a long-winded answer, but um, I think I hope I did. Was there anything I missed? Uh, no, you covered it all actually. And uh, we have a lot of questions from the audience, and one top one from actually Dr. Nameri. He's asking, what would you do, and I'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Hodder, um, what would you do um, for a patient, 45-year-old, with a BMI of 52, a non-smoker with diabetes, and a hiatal hernia, and a herniated fundus? That's a tough one. Um, for me, that's fairly straightforward. I would do a laparoscopic ruin wide gastric bypass with a, a hiatal hernia repair uh, for that patient. I think it's a non smoker with diabetes, a bit higher BMI than our average, and um, I think that would be a good operation for them. Would you do anything um, um, with the biliopancreatic limb, uh, other than being a BMI of 50? And no, we know that short BP limbs sometimes. Uh, they don't lose uh, a lot of weight at BMI of 52. Yeah, I think the the evident the the information about how distal or how to manage the limbs is not entirely clear, to be honest. Um, you know, I think you're you're asking whether or not they, they would be more appropriate for a more malabsorptive type of procedure. Um, where in 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 this situation, I think the Ruin Y um, configuration would be the best um, that for her. And the answer about the limbs is not something we currently have a lot of information on, to be honest. So um, um, I, I, it would be hard to comment using data for that. And a follow-up question, uh, and I guess the perfect to answer that would be uh, Professor Ang Angrisani. Would you use mesh on the hiatus? Well, I, I, I have a limited experience with mesh. I must tell you that uh, there has been an era in my learning curve in repairing the crura where I have used the uh, pledgets, uh, non-absorbable Marlex or proline, uh, uh, polypropylene uh, pledget. And uh, actually, it is my, my accuracy has not improved very much, but when I have gone back in that area, it has been a disaster, very difficult, very complex dissection. It's like, uh, it's not like, it's worse than cancer because cancer, sometimes you may get a plane, but in that case, it's terrible. So definitely I would uh, uh, discourage uh, sharply to use uh, Marlex mesh or non-absorbable material. I have a limited experience with biological material uh, that that was uh, was uh, good in my in my limited experience, but cannot comment. Too limited experience. But uh, what I'm using currently is non-absorbable uh, V-lock uh, continuous suture, and 
I, I but but this is uh, irrelevant i think if he's continuous interrupted the local simple problem what is what i think is very very important is uh, sharp dissection of the crura but sharp dissection with abdominalization of this of the esophagogastric junction you must have three or four centimeter of the uh, esophagus well prepared and encircled and you need to stitch at beginning of the crura of the v that you see uh, in in the diaphragm and the uh, uh, approximation of that area is is very important the other things i suggest is to use the the tube to calibrate of course the crura and to test after you have repaired the crura if the the tube that you have used goes down very easily and from the anesthetic side because uh, otherwise you may create dysphagia but i think this is an area that requires a lot of an attention and super specialization to 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 get uh, satisfactory results let let me have uh, uh, one comment uh, to to wendy uh, observation that uh, um, there is some other point to reflux uh, beyond uh, ayatal hernia and i do agree with with wendy on that but i think that the other two critical points for getting uh, in a sleeve gastrectomy, a, a, a model for esophageal reflux. The other two points are, one, the amount of fondus that is left, because it is quite clear that if you do not have a complete fundectomy, you do not have, uh, an, uh, you, you remain with acid, acid secretion. So fundectomy is extremely important and to to accomplish a complete fundectomy is it require the belsay pad the fat pad mobilization until you do not have a clear exposure of the esophagogastric junction if you do not have that you do not accomplish fundectomy first and the other very important aspect that you mentioned that i do agree that are concurrent to the uh, eso uh, uh, to the reflux is the amount of antrum that you leave because uh, uh, there are people that leave uh, uh, in david noca for example that i have uh, seen many times is leaving uh, four three to five centimeter four five centimeter of antrum that is another uh, important point uh, and other people like myself go standard not for nissen for nissen i agree with the david you need to stay four or five centimeters from the pylorus but i go very sharp close to the pylorus so these are two other aspects that are important for reflux because of course if you do sharp at the uh, duodenum you risk a lot of uh, duodenal gastric reflux without having the uh, pyloric sphincter Thank you, Ahmad, for involving me again. Thank you. No, oh, no, you're welcome, uh, Professor Angersani. Uh, uh, Professor Hemphens, now um, uh, a little bit of a comment on the mesh and the hiatus, that's one. And wh what's in your back, um, uh, in the back of your mind, whenever you make a decision regarding Barrett's, do you look at um, potential uh, uh, progression to Esophageal adenocarcinoma and the loss of uh, uh, the uh, uh, conduit, gastric conduit, whenever you make a sleeve, the decision for sleeve. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. Um, of course, there's other ways to treat uh, the basal cancer, and uh, when you do when it's a vasectomy, you can replace it by by other means than by by stomach. Uh, but it is it is a, a uh, an issue, of course. Um, regarding and that's why actually I try to avoid performing sleeve gastrectomy in very young people. Uh, it may sound uh, 
uh, stupid, but I think it, it's, um, I, I really try not to take out uh, parts of the body uh, in younger people because you never know what the future will bring. Anyway, so concerning the, I think you asked also about the hiatus, uh, yeah. how to treat it. Uh, well, I personally uh, use pledges. I use uh, pledges of cellulose acetate, which is a surgery cell. And I do that uh, to avoid to cut through the uh, muscle fibers. Because uh, very often, uh, and you know that when you don't use any reinforcement in inguinal hernia, for instance, you know that there will be a recurrence. So why wouldn't there be a recurrence uh, up there? And on the other hand, the use of regular prosthesis uh, I try to avoid because the literature is pretty much against it. So uh, I, I started uh, using surgery cell pledgets to like support the, the, the stitches. And I also use barbed wire suture now. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Empens. Um, Oliver, um, there are an issue with numbers when it comes to Barrett's and he wanted to talk about rates. Now we know long segment uh, Barrett's is less frequent than short segment Barrett's. One would assume you, we would see more esophageal cancers in short segment Barrett's overall, uh, not as a rate. But could you comment on those uh, issues, please? Um, okay, so in, in terms of um, the issue of length and the concomitant existence of Barrett's and adenocarcinoma, the um, studies that, that looked at that initially, they were studies that were looking at pathology specimens. And I think it's largely been assumed that the cancer that develops just outgrows the segment of Barrett's and therefore we had differences in assumptions regarding length. And I think the best sort of studies that address the issue of length as a risk factor are sort of the one that I mentioned, the recent meta-analysis. Um, as well as as well as well um, the study by Heiko Pohl, which does seem to show that length matters. And I mean, I guess pathophysiologically, that would make more sense. You have, you have field effects in Barrett's, right? So not, and that's why you have to sample all the different quadrants and sample them so closely, because what's happening in one little quadrant of Barrett's might be completely different genetically what's happening in, different, in a different area. And if you have a longer segment and therefore a higher surface area and more different Barrett cells, then the likelihood of something going wrong there is higher. So I think that's why it's quite widely accepted that length matters. In terms of the question regarding incidence rates and the different, and there was also a question, I think, from one of the um, people in the audience. So yes, with the, these studies that have come out, and I think there are quite a few meta-analyses looking at similar topics, you're going to find variations in the percentages of the calculated particular post-operative incidences. Um, and that largely is methodological. Um, and so with our study, we incorporated, as I said, information and data from um, conference abstracts that, and we know that sort of about only 20% of conference abstracts actually go on to getting published. And so we have probably got a bit more information than available if you just look at select um, online portals for publications. Um, and then also our filtering criteria and assessment of risk of bias, et cetera, is probably different. But you're not going to find hugely different numbers, you know. So we calculated, in, let's say, for sleeve, about a post-op incidence rate of about 6%. I think there's a paper that says 8%. You know, then there's another paper that says maybe it's around 5 You know, that, that's methodological variation. And I think also what we need to bear in mind is you need to look at the confidence intervals of our estimates as well. And they're huge, right? They're, so... Um, there are widely diverging um, estimates out there, and that's why you're going to you're going to get depending on how you run the stats, you're going to get slightly different estimates. Um, but yeah, we we employed a certain approach which we thought was methodologically sound, but I'm open to discussions about that. All great points, thank you, Oliver. And uh, um, one question, another question from the audience is. Have, uh, have you seen de novo esophagitis or persistence of Barrett's after a gastric bypass? And uh, what is the percentage? I, I know we looked at Barrett regression after from the studies, um, but any of the panelists would uh, want to comment on that? Uh, 
uh, yeah. I can come quickly on that. Just uh, yeah. Um, so I mean, from those studies, if if sixty two percent regressed, then thirty eight percent remained stable. So that's sort of what you can assume that probably about a third of patients will remain stable with their disease. Um, in terms of progression, uh, I, I personally, as a fellow, have had the pleasure of operating on two cases with esophageal adenocarcinoma after rural and wide gastric bypass. So that proves to me, just simply based on experience, that it's not a protective, you know, 100% fail safe um, procedure. But um, it's, I think the encouraging thing is, is that at least it indicates that the diversion of acid at least seems to have a pr protective effect uh, and allows the mucosa to heal. Um, but I also have to flag that we really don't quite understand regression of Barrett's. Like we don't like, as I mentioned, first of all, definitions aren't clear. Secondly, we don't we don't really know why it happens, and it's even debated if it actually does happen truly or if there's just overgrowth of of the the cells with squamous mucosa and, and things like that. So um, I would say that. The more you spin the wheel, the worse the conversation gets because there are so many different details and issues with data, et cetera. And so, yeah, it's a complicated area, if I can say that as a cop-out. That's a good answer. Um, so uh, we've come to the final um, um, point of our webinar. And uh, I'd like to ask the panelists to make one final remark uh, each. Salman, would you start? Sure. First of all, I'd like to thank all the panelists and uh, Oliver for an excellent presentation. Of course, Manuela for organizing uh, this uh, webinar. So I think we need to, uh, uh, you know, not only uh, do a clinical work, but also focus on research and uh, understand this point of view. I mean, as Oliver was saying, Barrett's and reflux is complicated and we need to know more. But I think bariatric surgery and bariatric metabolic surgery gave us the opportunity to understand more of this pathology, and it helped to move all the science in, in the right direction. And I'm sure with all these expertise that's happening with bariatric and metabolic surgery, I think we're going to have a better understanding of this pathology in the near future. Yeah, uh, Caetano. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank. Thank you very much for being invited for this panel. I really got more questions than answers now. Um, I will go after them because, you know, Oliver really, you know, kicked the ball towards a lot of big issues. And I'm sure we'll have to go after these, these answers. And uh, I would like to thank uh, again and for all the invitation. I think the more we go after this statement and hear it, I think it's very wise. There's a lot of wise decisions and advices talking to us saying, well, take care of this, take care of that, but still we don't have answers. So thank you very much. And I, I, I'm sure all the panel will go after these answers for the next following months. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Angersani, final comment. Well, I think, uh, I think uh, I must uh, uh, definitely congratulate with uh, Wendy and Oliver because uh, uh, recently I attended many, many uh, congress and meeting and seminar on this topic of Barrett, but none of them was clear enough as this one this morning. So I think Oliver with his actor voice and uh, very precise analysis of the literature really the, has, has made a, a very nice picture in my mind of what is Barrett. And uh, I think I must very, very much congratulate with Wendy and Oliver for that. And uh, my wish is that, uh, and my uh, stimulus is that I hope that we continue to uh, research on on this topic uh, that is uh, extremely important, uh, and uh, I hope with that Benny and Oliver want to continue. I would be pleased to do this uh, with them on the topic uh, of uh, uh, hiatal hernia and crural repair, because I think that uh, 
I remain convinced that this is a crucial area of improvement. Thank you very much to Ahmad and all the IFSO panel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Angelsani. Uh, Dr. Brown? Um, I think I don't have a lot to add other than to say really Oliver is the one that um, should take credit for this presentation. It's his work. He's a world expert on, he's very modest, but he is really an expert on Barrett's. And I think it's great to see young surgeons coming through that are duly trained in upper GI pathology and bariatrics because they bring some great experience to the table. And I just echo um, everyone's sentiments that we need to be studying this more. We need to be aggressively going out and getting the answers. Because um, when we look at this position statement again in two years' time, um, it'll be really interesting to see if just like the audience's opinions changed on how to manage that case, um, if the task force's um, opinion has changed. And thank you, obviously, always to Manuela and Ahmed for organising this, but also to the Scientific Committee of IFSO and to the Executive Board for their contributions to the paper. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, Dr. Hodder? I would like to echo uh, the comments. Uh, excellent presentation. Great uh, uh, statement that is out there. Great work, um, Ahmad and Manuela, for pulling this all together. And most importantly, it makes me want to get more information. Um, this is very important. It's meaningful. And, um, and we have very safe, effective treatments. We don't want to get sidelined. We need to manage this well. And we can only do that with data. So I think we should encourage people to study these things, study it well, um, use the right classifications, and, and follow these folks prospectively. It's hard, but it is critical. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Arder. Dr. Hempens. Uh, well, you know, I, I, can, I don't have to add anything, but I would really like to uh, congratulate uh, the Australians with the, their work. Uh, the accuracy of, of, of their and the detail that they put in all their publications. And I would recommend to everyone to read that paper in Annals that was published a few months ago uh, on uh, reflux, not really on Barrett, but on, on, on reflux and sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, and the way they dissect almost surgically uh, the physiology or the pathophysiology of GERD uh, and sleeves, it's, it's remarkable. And uh, to end, I think, uh, Oliver, your talk was great and the way you presented was even greater. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hempens. Uh, Oliver? Uh, well, I'm, I'm a bit lost for words, but uh, th <laughs> um, thank you so much for so the kind words, you know, coming out of my uh, office at home, uh, <laughs> speaking to the world. Uh, uh, a bit of a weight on my shoulders right now regarding this topic. Um, I guess I, I want to thank Wendy particularly for allowing me to speak about this because, uh, you know, when I wanted to work on this project, I came to her a few years ago and I said, look, I think it's really important that one tries to have an accurate conversation around this because there's a lot that's happened since people went to med school or they studied for their board exams, etc. Um, and so I really wanted to thank her for, for um, allowing me to sort of uh, go down this rabbit hole and, uh, and, and work on this project. And also wanted to thank the IFSO for allowing me to uh, present today on, on the topic. I think um, I can only say this is an evolving field. Um, I understand I've had some very heated discussions with peers um, of mine about this. Um, and I, I just, I just want to say, like everyone, that the key thing is that we capture this, that we try to understand what's going on, and that we study it further. And hopefully, you know, we'll be able to put it to bed one day and not worry too much about it. But um, with that, um, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity. Well, thank you all. It was uh, great. I uh, uh, actually agree with everyone. It was an eye-opening presentation, and the great thing about it it's simple and clear so thank you Oliver thank you to the panelists as well the most important pressing point is more research more data to get more answers definitely and uh, collaborations hopefully if so ASMBS and uh, all the chapters involved uh, should collaborate on this topic since the incidence is quite low um, thank you all uh, hopefully we'll meet again in the next webinar in April. Thank you.